This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Tyler Matheson. And I'm Sue Herrera. Tonight, we are taking a look at American entrepreneurship. Big dreams often start in small packages with a single bright idea. And that bright idea, along with hard work, can turn into a small business. And maybe with a little luck, that small business can one day make you millions. Well, we begin tonight with one man's bright idea. Ever find yourself wondering how much your medicine will actually cost at the pharmacy or maybe trying to discuss health issues in front of other customers when you're there? Prescription drugs are a $400 billion plus business, but only 1% is conducted online. One New York City entrepreneur got the bright idea to relieve some of the pain points with a digital full service pharmacy. When Eric Kinariwala went to his drugstore to pick up a prescription medication in January of 2015, his headache was just beginning. He waited in line nearly an hour before speaking to a pharmacist. She said, I'm so sorry, we're out of stock of Z-Packs. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, it's January, like this is the only thing the pharmacy should have. I can't believe that this is an experience that exists on every street corner in America. It's a problem that's getting worse. 42% of the respondents in a 2016 survey said their pharmacy was out of stock at least once, causing them to make a return trip, up from 33% back in 2013. You put the script on hold. Struck by his own frustration and pulling on his background as an investor in the healthcare, retail, and technology fields, Kinari Walla came up with a concept for an online pharmacy. He refined it for more than a year with an old friend, pharmacist Sonia Patel. Most pharmacy systems are built on technology that was founded maybe 20 years ago, and it didn't work for the pharmacists, it didn't work for the consumer, and it also didn't work for the doctors or insurers. They found these healthcare players need better communication tools, that pharmacies have to improve inventory systems, and that customers want transparent pricing. Aiming for solutions, they opened Capsule in the spring of 2016. Available only in New York City, customers can order online or ask their doctors to do it for them. The company says tens of thousands of people and thousands of physicians are using Capsule. Like other pharmacies, Capsule negotiates prices with wholesalers and takes a cut from the retail sales. Capsule does not discuss whether it's profitable just yet. Customers can pick up in person in Manhattan, but most opt for free delivery. A team of 60 couriers, staff employees, often braving the elements, deliver anywhere in New York's five boroughs. The business opportunities are huge. I'm looking at our prescriptions. And Dr. Jeffrey Dobro, chief medical officer at One Medical, isn't just telling his patients to shop around for medications these days. He's doing it himself because he's finding better prices online for his own medications, sometimes less than half the price his pharmacy benefits manager, or PBM, gets at CVS. Two out of five were wildly mispriced. I just cannot imagine what the average consumer has to deal with. Why the difference? What the independents do is try to find the cheapest price they can across the market for each individual medication. The PBMs are looking at a bundle of medications. It may be several thousand medicines. For the insurance company, the bundle's less expensive, but for an individual consumer, one particular drug may end up being much more expensive. Capsule alerts customers when it can beat their insurance company's price, but the company prefers not to be called an independent pharmacy. It has big plans. We will absolutely expand the business nationally and internationally over time uh, because we think the business works everywhere. Confidence that comes from experiences like the one Sonia Patel had texting with a customer only weeks after Capsule opened. She said, hey, Sonia, can I take iron supplements while I'm pregnant? And then it was this dot, dot, dot. By the way, is it weird that you're the first person I'm telling I'm pregnant? My husband doesn't even know yet. And we just had this amazing moment of, wow, we built this experience that people have an incredible degree of trust in. Pharmacists have long ranked high in the surveys of the most trusted professionals, but Capsule views healthcare as an ecosystem, and it's hoping to help doctors, insurance companies, drug makers, and patients work more efficiently together. Open up the maps on a smartphone and it tells you where you are. So how come it is not as easy to find you 
if you call 911 on a cell phone, a dangerous fact if you consider 70% of the roughly 240 million 911 calls we make each year come from cell phones. And that's why two young entrepreneurs in New York City are busy trying to fix that problem. Where you're saying you're at and where the phone shows you're at is about five miles apart. It's a problem that's dogged 911 operators. Built in the 1960s, 911 works well with landline phones, but call on a cell phone and 911 gets only an approximate location, often using nearby cell towers, even if the call is made at a 911 call center. It's roughly 4,000 meters away from where we're actually at. That's why Joe Thomas's staff at the Sussex County Emergency Operations Center in Delaware is testing rapid SOS, software allowing the existing 911 system to read more data coming from smartphones. It pinpoints it right on top of the building where we're located. Michael Martin got the idea after he felt like he'd been followed home in New York City one night back in 2012. 911 call takers are doing heroic work in light of that challenge but we're giving them basically no data to manage those calls. In grad school, he teamed with Nicholas Horlick, who'd volunteered taking calls on an emergency hotline during college. It was the same type of problem of someone's calling in, they're in distress and no idea where they are. So they co-founded Rapid SOS, but perhaps more important than their tech know-how was the four years they spent taking input from government officials and many of the 6,500 911 call centers. In 2016, they released a free app called Haven. Last December, Harrison Dandria got lost when a thick, damp fog rolled in as he hiked in North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains. Your mind just goes into frantic mode. So he tapped the Haven app on his phone. Operator told me to stay right where I was, and a park ranger would be there within 15 minutes, and they were. Almost 20% of the nation's 911 call centers are using rapid SOS, but it may cover most of the country by year's end. For some, it can't happen soon enough. In 2014, an FCC study said fixing 911 location issues could save more than 10,000 lives a year. Congress uh, talked about it, but there hasn't been any uh, legislation, let alone any passage um, of something that would, uh, that would make a difference. Tom Wheeler is one of three former FCC chairmen who have invested in Rapid SOS. They have built a platform that can be applicable in multiple kinds of situations, not just 911 calls. Those situations, upgrades to home security, car monitors like OnStar, and wearable health devices are where Rapid SOS hopes to make money. If this were on a health wearable device, this screen's going to have health information, heart rate, blood pressure. If it's coming from a connected car, now it's a, it's a picture of the car. Where was the impact? Airbags deployed? Who was wearing a seatbelt? How many people were in the vehicle? The cost? About 3 to $10 a month. It could be a small price to pay. The enormity of what it is we work on here, I think that affects everybody on our team. I mean, that's what really drives all of us. This is technology that's going to have the, the power to save a lot of lives. One interesting addition Rapid SOS has made, if a phone has a camera, it can put out a video feed, which a 911 operator can then push to first responders, giving them a chance to see what they're getting into before they arrive on site. Well, if you're still using an old school but still fashionable wristwatch, you might appreciate the handiwork of a Philadelphia entrepreneur who got the bright idea to design a timepiece built with natural materials, hearkening back to a simpler time in today's digital world. If you make and sell wristwatches these days, you have to compete with phones, Fitbits, smartwatches. It better be good and it ought to be different. Lorenzo Buffa's flexible wooden watch band, now that is different. My personal interest in material development led to the world's first soft and flexible wooden watch band. Once you flatten it back out, it pretty much appears unmarred. Wooden accessories were trending in 2012, but Buffa says wood watches then weren't up to snuff. Aiming to do better, Buffa's senior project at Philadelphia's University of the Arts led him down a twisted path iteration after iteration, until he settled on a wood veneer, 
backed by leather, a process he has since patented. Then, posing as a professor, he began to contact design blogs and magazines about a student who'd made something he thought they should see. The watch got some press, and manufacturers as far away as China began to contact him. As the kind of gumption you need as an entrepreneur, so I have total, total no shame. His moxie and passion for natural materials convinced Bufa to start the Analog Watch Company. The thing is, his watches aren't analog. We actually use quartz movements, which are battery powered. A conventional analog watch would be a mechanical watch, but we're at a lower price point. Analog's wood watches sell for $150. That tick, tick, tick movement of the second hand is a quartz movement instead of a smooth sweep. Analog references are desired to be focused on the simpler things. Our goal, obviously, is to inspire people and to add a little bit of nature to their everyday. Say you have a piece of wood. In 2013, so Bufa got hundreds of pre-orders on Kickstarter, raising $75,000. At the time, Kickstarter had partnered with New York's Museum of Modern Art. Buyers at the museum's gift shop placed Analog's first wholesale order. Today, the business is about 60% online retail and 40% wholesale, mostly museum shops across the country. They appreciate the ingenuity that goes into the design process, really the materials on display. In 2015, Analog put a new material on display, marble, as well as a line of classics with watch faces made of either wood or marble. The mid-century aesthetic attracted orders from New York's Guggenheim Museum. I barely have to sell these. The staff barely has to sell them because people really recognize them for what they are. Gigi Luizzo helps pick products for the Guggenheim's shop. We have to stay connected to the Art Noir collection or, of course, the actual building, which is a beautiful piece of art itself. That vision belonged to architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who famously connected his work to its natural surroundings. His circular design and use of light, both inspired by nature, turned museum architecture inside out. Nature inspires Bufa's work, too. There are wooden sunglasses now and a botanist collection of watches and jewelry featuring real flowers encased in resin. Frank Lloyd Wright, he's not, but perhaps Bufa's time is yet to come. And we've been able to carve some space for us because we're really creating conversation pieces or what some of our museums call wearable works of art. For his next trick, Bufa's working on a new product using cork. Ever since Price Club introduced consumers to the idea of stocking up and saving in the 1970s, we've been snapping up bulk size packages. Now the biggest of the warehouse stores, Costco, Sam's Club and BJ's, do about $200 billion worth of business each year. And that's why one New Jersey entrepreneur got the bright idea to put bulk discounts online. It sounds so storybook, starting a company in your parents' garage. The computer was right here. There was still a car on that side. Man, it sure isn't sexy when you're sitting here and not getting an order on a single day. Che Wong and his team went from the garage to a $100 million a year business, Boxed, selling bulk-sized snacks, food, paper towels, toilet paper, Costco and Sam's Club fare, online. Here are 150,000 square feet. The garage could only fit like 200 items. Just up the road from his parents' home, the newly automated New Jersey warehouse can ship tens of thousands of items in a day. There are also fulfillment centers in Las Vegas, Dallas, and Atlanta. Wong got the idea while he was in law school, living in New York City, where he didn't have access to the bulk discounts his parents grew to depend on in the suburbs. We just didn't have the time, the patience, or frankly, living in a city, the, the car to get up to uh, the Price Club or to Costco or to Sam's Club anymore. And so we thought, how many millions of other Americans had the same problem? Oh, not, I thought outdoor signs. Was Wong and his team what? wanted a mobile solution, an app. Mobile is part of their DNA, having sold their mobile video game studio, Astro Ape, to Zynga. They went after retail, and at the time, it was risky. Consumers were shopping on phones in 2013. Most of their buying was done on computers. Over the last four years, it's become mainstream, uh, and that's in 48 months. The consumer mindset has shifted in such a dramatic fashion. Works. Lunches. Lunchtime's coming. 
Laura Kapusinski has been using Boxed for more than three years. I always joke with people that I don't leave the house unless I have to. Uh, Boxed has really helped me be home with the children and doing things that I want to do as opposed to things I have to do. Boxed has no membership fees, competitive pricing, and free shipping on orders of $49 or more. Wong targeted busy individuals, but in terms of dollars, its biggest customers are other businesses. That's caught us by surprise, how big B2B is, uh, is for us. Perhaps another surprise? No one lost a job when the New Jersey warehouse turned on its automated system this summer. Eight months in the making, costing millions, it's got a four-story automated sorting system and nearly three miles of track. Box trained the same employees who pushed carts and filled orders by hand to run its new system. It was about actually preparing them for the future where all jobs and fulfillment centers and maybe even a lot of retail jobs uh, will look like what you're looking at behind us. It took a lot of folks getting out of their comfort zone uh, to say, hey, I don't even have a college education and you're asking me to, to troubleshoot robotics when it goes down? And I said yes. And how about this for work-life balance? We'd love to pay for your wedding so that you guys can have it. <laughs> Boxed is helping to pay for employee weddings and their children's college education. Well, the last thing I want on my tombstone is here lies Che Huang, like innovator of toilet paper shipping. I'd much rather have here lies Che Huang, you know, made a difference in people's lives. Boxed is also building its own robots to help make its system even more efficient. And still ahead, second acts, why some older Americans are making it big by doing what they love. Small businesses are often considered the backbone of the economy. They're job creators and innovators. But many are trying to overcome a major obstacle, finding skilled labor. Kate Rogers has the story from Denver. For Denise Burgess, the biggest challenge in running her construction management firm is simply finding the right people for the job. Her business, Burgess Services, is a second-generation family-owned company with 12 to 15 year-round employees. But depending on the size of the project she's working on, Burgess can need more than 100 subcontractors at a time. And that's when things get complicated. They're younger, uh, not as trained, not as seasoned as previously. And it's also a career path that's not glamorous. It's not Silicon Valley software. It's not Facebook. It's something that you're going to work hard, but you also get paid really well for. So it's a hard thing. It's a hard sell, not an impossible sell. Burgess isn't alone in struggling with the workplace skills gap. In fact, finding skilled labor has become a top three issue for Main Street behind taxes and government regulations. And here in Denver, it's an extremely tight labor market with unemployment at just over 2%. This is really good news that, that companies are looking to hire, um, uh, but it's, it's a real struggle for them sometimes. It's always a particular problem for smaller companies that don't have the networks that large companies do. West of Denver in Evergreen, Colorado, Tony Song employs seven full-time workers at his bike shop, Evergreen Bicycle Outfitters. Song knows those with particular skill sets, including his top two mechanics, would be nearly impossible to replace. As it stands today, um, with the labor market being uh, what it is and how competitive it is, uh, in the front range, um, it would be very difficult for us to find a replacement for uh, somebody with that level of experience. So Song, like Burgess, works to offer competitive benefits like a health care stipend, paid time off, and flexibility in scheduling to hang on to the good workers both small businesses have. With the cycling industry uh, being what it is, there are very few people who are making you know, six figures plus. So uh, our ability to be able to re retain employees has to come from somewhere outside of just uh, the, the dollar figure that they're making. That ability to hold on to their enjoyment in working in the bike shop is, is very key. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers, Denver. Sometimes business opportunities come later in life, and a growing number of older Americans are able to do what they love chase their passion, and run a successful business. Kate Rogers is back this time. The story takes her to Philadelphia. Brian Kravitz has seen his career come full circle. He began fixing typewriters in the 1970s and continued until computers came on the scene. 
But much to his delight and surprise, typewriters are back in vogue and Kravitz is in business for himself. I just feel really good. I get up every day. I don't want to sit around. I'm not going to, what am I, what can I do? Go to the golf course? No, not me. I want to do things. He launched his business, Philly Typewriter, in 2015, fixing and selling machines that date back to the 1920s. Kravitz worked for years in marketing and direct mail and said his experience in the workforce has helped him with his latest venture. I'm much more aware because I've had so many more experiences in being in business and doing things with people. While millennial entrepreneurs like Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg may be grabbing headlines, 2015 data from the Kauffman Foundation found that baby boomers were nearly twice as likely as millennials to plan to launch their own businesses. Experts say the rise in boomer entrepreneurship is part of byproduct of the financial crisis that decimated retirement savings of many and part the desire to remain active. Most older people uh, approaching the traditional retirement age are actually looking to stay active beyond 65. They miss the, uh, the social aspect of, of work, they miss the purpose of work, and work is an important emotional contribution to people's sense of identity. And I don't think that that you know, disappears just because you hit a particular chronological age. Daryl Jennings launched his business, American Music Furniture Company, in 2013 and today has seven employees and two co-owners, making humidifying cabinets for guitars. While he's seen success selling cabinets to musicians like Jason Isbell and Clay Cook from the Zac Brown Band, there are challenges in being an older entrepreneur. The biggest challenge is the fact that you're not going to make money for, for quite a while. If you start a business, it always takes more money than you think it will. Uh, it takes more time than you think it will. But he has only one regret. I wish I'd done it sooner. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers, Philadelphia. Coming up, how one entrepreneur turned his love of flowers and fruit into a multi-million dollar business. Some of you may have at some point sent an edible arrangement as a gift or maybe you even received one. I sat down with the founder of the company to hear how his strong work ethic at an early age led him to create a half billion dollar business selling fruit, but not just any fruit. You know, so what you're doing oh, is you're spinning it because you're putting here. a little bit of a finish on it. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Entrepreneur Tarek Fareed certainly has a reason to celebrate. Cheers. Cheers. His All company, right. Edible Arrangements, has mushroomed into an international sensation. How much total revenue? No, a little over $600 million. It's a success that stems from humble beginnings. At 12 years old, Tarek and his family came to the United States from Pakistan settling in 1981 in West Haven, Connecticut. Since money was tight, he and his siblings had to get busy fast. My mother would sit there and, you know, kick us out of bed every day and say, go work hard. Tell me about your earliest days as an entrepreneur. I had a lady living down the street from me. I would go cut her grass and um, help her with the lawn. And she goes, honey, you know, if you keep working this hard, you'll be a millionaire by the time you're 35. And I like the ring of that. Within a year, Tarek took a job with a local florist, where he learned the importance of customer service and creative design. And when an opportunity arose to buy a defunct floral shop in nearby East Haven, Connecticut, Tarek moved fast. With $6,000 borrowed from his father's boss, Tarek became the owner of Farid's Flowers. Who gave you the lease on the shop? Who's going to sign a lease with a 17-year-old? I don't think he knew that the 17-year-old was going to be actually running it. But he did run it, dividing his time between the shop and school. The business grew into three local locations. More than a decade later, in 1999, the seed that really took root was his idea, one he'd been toying with for a couple of years, sell fruit arrangements that looked like flowers. I used to call it a wow, that when a person receives it, when it arrives at the house, the first thing out of their mouth should be, wow, you know, that reaction had to be there. <laughs> My favorite thing about Edible is that we're an experience company. Somia Farid, Tarek's daughter, is the special projects manager at Edible Arrangements headquarters in Wallingford, Connecticut. I've been in the stores ever since I was a kid. Um, I used to hang out there after school. Um, I started taking orders when I was 12 years old. 
Still, it wasn't easy for Tarek to transition from flowers to fruit. I would go to a supplier and say, hey, can you make me a food safe floral container? And they'd be like, get out of here. You know, what are you talking about? You know, wh why would we do that? We put flowers in it. He had to create the company's entire supply chain from scratch. Everything from child safe skewers to securing what he says is the world's freshest fruit. By 2000, the business was building real traction and Tarek began getting requests to franchise the business. Somebody saw the Waltham Mass one and called from Atlanta and said, hey, I just saw this and opened the one in Atlanta. Somebody in Atlanta called someone in New Jersey and then somebody from New Jersey called and said, hey, I just saw this. Uh, can I buy one for New Jersey? And next thing I know, I was in Northridge, California, opening the eighth store. How many stores today? Uh, 1,300. Today, Edible Arrangements is available in nine countries. About 60% of orders come in online but they're fulfilled by local shops. For the Farids, it's been a fruitful journey and one that continues to blossom. There's a lot that goes into it that we have spent the last 18 years perfecting. Tarek Farid, from immigrant to American dream, getting rich the old-fashioned way, slowly. Edible Arrangements fruit bouquets range in price from about $40 to upwards of $1,000 for more extravagant uh, custom displays. The company is now focusing its efforts on expanding its product lineup to include fruit parfaits and smoothies in a push to drive brick and mortar sales. Sounds delicious. Very good. Thanks so much for watching this special edition of Nightly Business Report. I'm Sue Herrera. And I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for me as well. Have a great evening, everybody, and we'll see you back here next time.